It's a real honour to be here speaking to you tonight. Um, we're going to have a, a cruise through everything you need to know about influenza uh, with a mind thinking about what's going to happen when the next influenza pandemic comes. This behind me is a picture of the world at the first week when the World Health Organization declared the last influenza pandemic, which was in 2009. That was sometimes called the swine flu, or also known as the pandemic H1N1, because us few people love to give our viruses <coughs> names with H1Ns and various letters. But the little dots you can see on each circle, the diameter of those dots says how many people in that week had been diagnosed at that time point to flu. This is the 6th of June, 2009. And you can see that although we hadn't even heard of this virus till about April, 2009, we've already had hundreds and hundreds of cases being reported all around the world. Not surprising in a day and age when aeroplanes are flying backwards and forwards from people going on holiday to Mexico, bringing the virus back to Scotland. The first case, I believe, in the UK was here in Glasgow from such an individual. So that's what happens when we have a pandemic emerging today. And what we're going to think about is where does that virus come from and what are we going to do about it when the next one comes along. But of course, it's quite an apt time of year to be talking to you about flu because we've got our annual pandemic or our annual outbreak going on right now. Uh, we're right in the middle of flu season. There are hundreds and hundreds of people going to their GPs, going to the hospitals with influenza at the moment. And of course, we have an outbreak of seasonal flu every single year. Uh, about 10% of, of us contract seasonal flu each winter. And every year that results in about half a million deaths worldwide. And in fact, if you add up all the illness, the cost, and the death of the seasonal flus that we experience every year, they do outweigh the pandemics. But it's much more scary when a new virus comes along because we don't know what to expect. And everybody around the world gets the same virus all at once. And so it feels like a much more explosive outbreak than the annual seasonal flu that, that we see every year. So we know that there have been pandemics for, for as long as humans have lived in close uh, contact with animals and lived in <coughs> societies and cities and towns. Uh, but the, the pandemics that we really know more about are the ones that have happened in the last 101 years, uh, because those are the ones where good clinical medical records and some evidence of what the virus is, uh, is available to us. And as has already been mentioned in the very nice introduction, we know the most, uh, the, the, the most deadly pandemic that we've experienced in recent history, at least as a, as a human population, is in 1918 with this pandemic called Spanish flu. Uh, and upwards of 50 million people died in a very short space of time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that one and what we know about it and, and think about it. But, but I would be surprised looking around the room if anybody is a survivor of that pandemic. <laughs> but I do think that we've probably got some survivors of the 1957 Asian flu pandemic uh, in the room with us. And certainly uh, I'm a survivor of the 1968 Hong Kong flu pandemic and then the more recent one, 2009. And you can see that 2009 was a much milder pandemic. Uh, only half a million deaths recorded, uh, but at huge cost, because as often is the case in pandemics, the people who really had the impact of that pandemic were the young, often previously healthy adults, the working people who are not now going to work, and the cost to the world is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So for all of those reasons, uh, because it's, it's worrying, it's scary, uh, and because it costs a lot of money, uh, various people, including the UK government, would very much like to know more about what to do about a pandemic. And this little illustration here shows you that indeed the UK government are worried about a pandemic. They have a thing called a national risk register for civil emergencies, and they imagine uh, all the different terrible things that, that could happen, from uh, travel accidents to uh, bad weather incidents, volcanoes erupting in the UK, uh, and they plot those on this graph. So along the x-axis here of this graph is how likely is this bad thing to happen. And then up on the y-axis is how bad would it be if it happened. And you can see right up here, scoring the highest on both counts, is pandemic influenza. So it's really something that everybody knows is going to happen again. 
<clears throat> and we know that it will be of some concern and we need to be prepared for it. What we don't know is exactly when is the next pandemic going to come, nor exactly how severe it will be, because as you can see from the spectrum of the four pandemics I showed, you can have pandemics which have quite a low case fatality rate, which thankfully the most recent one was, or you can have very different situations. But whichever one of those it is, we're going to need a strategy to deal with it because when the, when the first appears, uh, the newspapers will have headlines which will worry everybody, the public will need to know that something is being done. So what can we do and can we do anything once it's happened and can we do anything to make it less likely to happen in the first place? So if you cast your mind back to how it must have been in 1918, it must have been incredibly scary because back then, of course, there was no treatment. There was no flu vaccine. There was no idea of what was actually causing this devastating disease. And as has been mentioned, what was particularly scary was, as we see in pandemics, several, it's the young adults, the 25, 20 year old to 45 year olds who seem to unusually come down with flu, whereas normally in a flu season, as we're such experiencing now, we see the very young babies, less than two years old, the very old, people in their 70s and above, the people in the middle uh, are normally not suffering from flu. In the pandemics, we see the opposite. And here's a, a lovely stained glass window from a small church in a Leicestershire village with this lady here who's at the age of 29 getting married in the autumn of 1918. And two weeks later, here she is on her deathbed. So that really brings home the personal stories of, of sort of young lives lost. So what is this all about? How can that happen? How can a young, previously healthy person get infected with something and then just die so quickly? What is the causative agent? So the causative agent is a virus, the influenza virus. And I really like this particular picture of a flu virus because it's transparent and it's colourless. And in one of the um, sort of media interviews that I was persuaded to do, one of the clever journalists did ask me, what colour is a virus? And I had to think for a long time because I, I didn't know. And I think my conclusion is that viruses don't have colour because viruses are so small that they are smaller than the, the wavelength of light which has colour. Therefore, I think this is a very good representation of what a virus is like. It's, a, it's sort of this see-through transparent thing uh, which, which is so small it has no colour. So this virus here, of course, you, you're looking at a representation of what it is. When we measure it by imaging the virus in the electron microscope, because we can't see it in any other way, you can see this virus is about 100 nanometers across. And what that means is that if I have a one centimeter fingernail, I can get 100,000 viruses end to end across my fingernail. So these things are tiny. And all they are is a bag of genetic material. They're not really alive because this virus sitting here on its own, sitting on a bench, floating around the air, will not do anything. It is a, the absolute parasite. The only way that this thing can work is if it gets inside your cells. And then when it does that, it takes over your cells and it commands them to do its work for it. It commands them to make hundreds or thousands of copies of itself, each one identical to the first virus that got in. So the virus we can think of as sort of uh, a bag, and you can see from this representation that the bag is studded with lots of little spiky protrusions, and there are little sort of blobbly shapes on the end of those protrusions. So there's about 400 of these spikes on, on the virus, and the outside of the virus is, is this sort of um, copies after copies of this same shape repeated all over the place. That outside is what your body, your immune system can see when this virus is trying to infect you. And the only way that you won't get infected by that virus is if you've already seen something like it before and made an antibody that can coat each one of those hundreds of spikes and stop them from latching onto your cells and entering the cells. And that's how vaccines work and that's how protection works. If you get infected with one type of flu virus once in your life, you'll never get that one again. But unfortunately, there are lots of different types out there so you can keep on getting flu several, uh, several times throughout your life. <coughs> Inside that bag, uh, which is carrying the genetic material, you can see this sort of coil here. That's, that's the genetic material. That's what tells the virus what it's going to be. 
and the whole purpose in the life, if it even is the life of a virus, is just to make more copies of that and to move around from one cell to another, one person to another, just commanding cells to make more copies of itself. So this picture here is a, is a, a force-coloured image to make it a little bit more beautiful. This is a cell, a human cell, that has been infected about six hours previously with one of those influenza viruses. And all of these sort of worm-like protrusions now are the virus pushing its way back out through the membrane of the cell. And the end of these, you can see little um, sort of bubbles on the end, those will pinch off and make new copies of virus. So this cell, you can see, is, is making probably about a 1,000 viruses, each one of them, pushing out from its membrane. And here's another picture looking down on the surface of a cell. And this cell here, colour, false coloured in blue, each one of these little spheres is a new virus, which has been made from a single virus entering that cell a few hours ago, taking over the cell's machinery and commanding it to make thousands of copies of the virus. And you can see that these are all rolling down almost like a wave, ready to leave that cell and come on and infect all the neighbouring cells, or perhaps to float out into the air and infect the next person. So the virus has evolved over many years to do this supremely well. And it's no wonder that we have quite a fight on our hands to, to combat that sort of simple but very, very effective biology. In fact, these viruses are not really viruses of humans at all. The viruses are all parasites. All viruses are parasites. They all rely on a host to replicate them. And the host for influenza are birds, wild birds like ducks and geese. And in those wild birds, you can find many, many different influenza viruses, all of them looking subtly different in the shape of the spikes on the outside. And that means these are antigenically distinct. What I mean by that is that these bird viruses are completely different than any human viruses that we might ever have met in our lives before. And therefore, if one of those bird viruses crosses into a person, it can very readily infect that person because that person won't have ever been immunized or infected with that virus. They have no previous experience of that virus. And that's the origin of the pandemics. When bird viruses cross into humans, we can get pandemics. Now, we don't have a lot of close contact with ducks in our usual life. But of course, we do have contact with other animals, farmed animals, for example, chickens or pigs. And so we think that the route by which these bird viruses find their way into humans is probably through passing their virus on to farmed animals, particularly chickens. And you often see a scenario, for example, where a poultry farm uh, with, with open fields and water uh, can attract migratory waterfowl, for example, to stop by and use, share the water, and then that water may be then passing the virus on to chickens. What I should say is that in these wild birds, the ducks and the geese, the virus isn't a virus of the respiratory system at all. It's actually an enteric virus. It infects their guts and it's shed out into the water. And these migratory water birds go around in huge numbers and pass the virus to each other through the water. In the chickens, the virus can infect the, the birds throughout the whole body. And sometimes you will have heard that people become infected by acquiring bird flu viruses through exposure to chickens. So this has particularly been in the news in the last couple of decades and particularly uh, seen in areas of Asia where there is a very um, sort of, uh, particularly at this time of year actually, a, a sort of preference to obtain live meat. So they have live poultry markets very often in China, Hong Kong and other parts of Asia like Vietnam where people prefer to have very fresh meat, so they will go to the live poultry market, purchase their birds live, take them home, slaughter and prepare them themselves, but then become exposed. If those birds are infected with a bird flu, that exposes a person to a huge dose of virus, perhaps as they're plucking the feathers, you can imagine the sort of aerosolisation that, that somebody might breathe in that virus. And that has led to very severe cases of bird flu, Viruses with names like H5N1 or H7N9 have been in the news and featured in, in 
things like Time magazine, where people have really worried that if these bird flu viruses uh, continue to infect people, this will spark the next pandemic. What I want to make clear is that these viruses, as they stand, have only infected around about 1,000 people. That is not a pandemic. Those are individual cases of a person becoming exposed to a bird virus. But that person can get very sick, often die, but doesn't pass their virus on to the next person. And the only way the next pandemic will happen is when that happens. So what is it that a, a human seasonal flu does that a bird virus, a bird flu, doesn't do? It's the difference between the transmission, the transmission route. So for human flu, the only way that the virus can go from one person to another is through the air, in airborne droplets. So as that virus is replicating in the respiratory tract of the infected person, it comes out into the secretions, the, the fluids that line the lungs. And those virus particles can find their way into these small droplets. So all of us right now are breathing out small droplets into the room, tiny tiny, tiny particles. And if you were infected with a virus in your respiratory tract, some of those particles would contain viruses. Those particles remain suspended as aerosols in the air for minutes or even hours after you even leave the room. And someone else might then breathe those in and introduce the virus into close proximity with the cells of their own body by which the virus finds a route to enter and infect. So this airborne transmission is what seasonal influenza viruses and all viruses, influenza viruses that humans manages to do. But luckily for us, the avian influenza viruses are not good at doing that. However, the problem is that they can change. So it's a pretty tough life for a virus, actually. To be an airborne transmissible virus, what you have to do is you have to float around in the air as a virus in these tiny particles. You then have to be inhaled by a person, and then you have to reach these cells. This, this layer here, these represent the cells of your respiratory tract, your nose and your throat. And they are covered with this layer of mucus. And what influenza viruses that can transmit through the air can do is that they can chop their way through the mucus and reach those cells below. But avian influenza viruses, because they've never had to deal with human respiratory mucus, they, they don't know how to do that unless they undergo some mutations, some change. So if the avian viruses can transform themselves by mutating the way they work, into ones that can float in the air and chop through human mucus and infect the human airway cells, then what can happen is that this individual not only acquires the bird flu from the chicken, but also breathes out new viruses to more people. And those people breathe out more viruses to others, and so on and so on. And get a chain of transmission and an explosive outbreak, which is called the pandemic. So we now understand a lot about which of the avian viruses which are out there in nature have the potential to undergo these kinds of mutations and transform themselves through farmed animals into airborne transmissible viruses. And we know that all of the viruses that caused the pandemics of the 20th and 21st century must have reached us via this route. And we can define the mutations that undergo and we can look out for them. So we can look in the farms of Vietnam and China and Africa and America where the bird flus are found and we can say, are there any of those dangerous mutations appearing in those viruses? Because if there are, that's the first sign to ring the alarm bell to suggest that perhaps there's a pandemic on the way from that source. Now, the 1918 Spanish influenza was such a virus. We believe that it was a virus which originated either in Kansas or a part of North America or perhaps in, in the uh, camps where the army soldiers were, were at the end of the First World War. But it certainly was a virus wh whose very recent ancestors were bird viruses because you can look at the sequence and, and work out that these viruses were very recently in birds. The reason we can actually look at the genetic identity of that virus is because about 20 years ago now, um, it became possible to recover the, the bits of the virus from parts or archived samples which had been stored down in 1918. 
So as I said earlier, back in 1918, people didn't know what was causing this, but they did have the foresight to store samples. So for example, soldiers who had been infected and died from the 1918 flu, so an army soldier, um, an army medic had preserved the lungs by, by putting them on uh, paraffin fixed slides and stored them all in the archives of an army medical center uh, over in the United States. And back in the 1990s, a young army medic called Jeffrey Taubenberger discovered this big box of these slides and thought, I wonder whether or not I can use them to understand anything about this 1918 Spanish flu. So he was able to piece together what the virus must have been. And then using modern day techniques that we have in the lab, he could recreate that virus. That was quite a controversial experiment. This was a virus which had killed 50 million people around the world, or even more. The virus wasn't with us anymore. It was 100 years later. Uh, but this guy wanted to know more about that virus and understand it. So he pieced it together and recreated it in the lab. And then what it, that enabled him to do was to do a bunch of experiments to ask a question that had been posed by many people many times. Was this 1918 scenario so devastating because it was the end of the First World War and nobody had eaten well for a long time and everybody was tired and undernourished and any virus would have done this to a population? There was nothing special about this. Or was this a really, really nasty virus such that if it were to come again, we should be worried about this sort of scenario? And that's an important question to ask because we need to know in modern day whether or not such a virus could exist and could be highly transmissible through the air in such a way that it could kill 2% of everybody that it infects. So he posed that question and he recreated the 1918 Spanish flu and he performed a series of experiments in various models, including animals, and what he could see was that this virus really was a monster virus. It was a real perfect storm, as far as a virus is concerned, of kicking off this horrible, horrible response in the, the animals, for example, that were given this virus. They would be dead within 24 hours. And this picture here is, is the lungs, where you can see this blood-filled lungs, the hemorrhaging, just in the way that had been described by the medics back in 1918, who were describing these young men coughing up blood and, and being overcome by Spanish flu virus. So why does a virus do that? Our seasonal flu viruses don't do this. My theory, and, and what I'm trying, going to try and convince you of, is that these viruses which just have crossed from animals into humans, have just learned to be good enough to infect a human and pass amongst us, they're a bit like teenagers. They don't know how to behave. They're kind of learning their way, but they haven't learned the rules yet. And they come into a new host, the human host. They are parasites that have learned to exist in birds for thousands of years, but this virus now is in a human host and it's bashing around, replicating in an unregulated manner in all kinds of cells where it shouldn't be. You find these viruses have found their way into immune cells and they're replicating inside immune cells, which flu viruses don't normally do. Flu viruses just infect the lungs. So when viruses are in the wrong place at the wrong time, they kick off all of these silly and useless immunological responses. The immunopathology is what kills you. The person's own immune system has really been turned on itself. And this aberrant and inappropriate thing that we call the cytokine storm is going on where there's so much um, response that the virus is not being restricted, but the, the person's own immune system is actually shutting down uh, their, their organs and causing multi-organ failure. <coughs> And the reason I think that's the case is several fold. For example, there are lots of other instances where we have animal viruses that cross into humans and we see very, de very devastating effects. If you think about Ebola virus, we know Ebola virus comes out from animals uh, and gets into humans and those people have a very severe reaction and often die. From quite similar um, scenarios like this, this hemorrhaging. Uh, but also, we know that once that pandemic virus emerged in 1918, it caused a lot of bother. It killed 50 million or so people around the world, but it didn't actually go away. What happens with pandemics is that they, they stay with us and they come back year after year reinfecting humans as seasonal flu viruses. But we know that in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, 
We didn't see medical records of people dying from these terrible symptoms of the Spanish flu. Yet the virus was, that was going around in those decades must have been derived from the original Spanish flu virus. Now, I've been trying to get across to you that flu virus is able to change, it's able to mutate. Every time it replicates, it can undergo changes. And the way evolution works is that the best virus in the scenario is always the winner. For a virus to keep going in humans, it's no good if the virus kills everybody. Because if everybody's dead, there's nobody new to infect. It's actually not very good for a virus to make people very, very sick. Because if people are very sick, they stay at home and they don't go out and they don't breathe their viruses onto other people. The best thing for a virus to do is to not make many people sick at all because that's really successful. It can go from one person to the next. Nobody ever picks up. Nobody ever knows to, to go home and take any medication. They just go out walking around Sainsbury's and breathing on everybody and the virus spreads very well. So these viruses in, in the 1920s, 30s and 40s are adult viruses. They're the 1918 virus after it's grown up. But that first early 1918 flu was the horrible one that didn't know how to behave itself. And that's why it kicked off all those inappropriate cytokine storms and killed so many young, healthy people with their vigorous immune systems that turned upon themselves. So how severe will the next pandemic be? I think that's going to depend very much on where that virus has been most recently. If we think about 1918, we think that that virus was very recently a bird virus, which just crossed over from birds to people, didn't know how to behave itself, and kicked off all of this horrible immune response. If we think about what we see in people who unfortunately get infected with bird flu in Asia, again, we see humans infected with bird viruses, and the case fatality rate there can be as high as 60%. Once again, you get the cytokine storm, you get hemorrhaging, you get multi-organ failure. Whereas if we think about our swine flu, the last pandemic that we experienced, thankfully it was mild. And what we know about that is that the last animal host that that virus we can trace uh, before it jumped into humans was pigs. Now pigs are much more similar in their behavior, in their immune system, in their cellular makeup, to humans than our birds. So that virus had learned how to behave itself in pig cells before it passed into humans. And that's why it was not such a big problem to us and in fact the case fatality was a hundred times lower than the 1918 flu which was a direct jump from birds. So we can't predict at the moment which of those scenarios the next pandemic is going to be, but as soon as that virus emerges, we will be able to sequence it and tell where it's been most recently and what it's most like. And that will be really important information in the early weeks of a pandemic to help us decide and plan uh, what to expect in terms of hospitalisation, death and, and other um, issues. So what will our pandemic response be? Well, it would be lovely to think that we would be able to control the next flu pandemic with a public health control system. Perhaps we could shut down all the schools, screen people at the airports, stop the virus coming into the UK. I'm going to tell you in a minute, I think that's highly unlikely to work. You could already see from the map of the world I showed you in 6th of June 2009 that the pandemic would have reached our shores before we even know that it exists. So, what we like to do to control flu, and we know how to do it, is vaccination. So will we be able to make a vaccine fast enough for the new virus? And if we can't, what will we do instead? SARS is another example, actually, of these animal viruses which come straight out of animals into humans and can be very scary, very devastating. So SARS, if you cast your mind back to 2003, was a virus which emerged in Hong Kong, spread around the world to Canada and, and, and other parts of Europe. Um, and thankfully, we were able to control SARS with what was largely a public health strategy. And the reason that was possible is that people who are infected with the SARS virus, it's a different virus than influenza, and they are only contagious when they are showing symptoms. 
So SARS was a huge problem for healthcare workers. Sadly, several doctors and nurses died looking after people infected with SARS because those people were coughing and the virus was coming out and, it, and it, they were highly contagious when they were symptomatic. In fact, what we know about influenza is that influenza is contagious before you have symptoms. And even if you don't have any symptoms at all, you can still breathe out droplets loaded full of influenza virus and pass them on to someone else. And that's illustrated here in this, this graph. So influenza, 40% of infections are thought to come from people who aren't even showing any sign of illness. That's why it spreads so very rapidly and very easily. So it's not really going to be possible to um, use things like airport screening because the people walking through that screen are not going to show up as having a fever yet, but they might be breathing out virus which can infect the, 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 the new city where they're about to arrive to. The good news is, though, that unlike SARS, we have a lot of experience at treating influenza. Because we have seasonal influenza every winter, we know that we can make vaccines that work against flu, and we have some antiviral drugs that work against flu as well. So we've already done the, the show of hands about flu vaccine. I would imagine that everybody in the audience here who put their hand up as having received flu vaccine will have received what we call the inactivated flu vaccine. The injection into your arm of a small piece of that spike which was sliced off from that, the, the, the particle of virus that I showed you. It looks just like the virus. It fools your immune system into making the antibodies that can block that virus. But it isn't, you don't get a dose of flu. It's a, it's a jab of a protein in your arm, which is nothing like the virus. So you don't get flu when you have flu vaccine. You just get a tiny fragment of the virus particle which fools your immune system into, into making the right antibody response. We're working on improving flu vaccines all the time. They get a bad rap in the press. Some years they don't work terribly well. Um, last year, the, not last season, but the one before, there was a new vaccine on the market, which was called an adjuvanted vaccine. An adjuvant is a chemical that you can add to a vaccine to make even better immune response. And that really seems to have worked well in um, the 65s and over, and we managed to get flu vaccine up to 62% efficacy. So that means that, that you know, we only had a 62% chance or whatever, of a 38% chance of getting flu if you'd have had your vaccine. In activated flu vaccine, we can make millions of doses. The World Health Organization has contracts with vaccine manufacturers to generate 100 million doses in the first week of the next pandemic. Uh, or as soon as they can in the next pandemic. Um, but there is actually another vaccine on the market which is being used here in the UK, which is actually very exciting and I want to tell you about because I think there's a lot more potential for it. And that's uh, a different sort of vaccine that we give to children. So there is now available a live attenuated vaccine and this is really a virus. This little girl is being infected on purpose with a flu virus. But she's not going to get flu because this virus is a version of the virus which can't replicate at high temperatures of her body. This virus can only replicate in her nose and because her nose sticks out from her face, it's cooler than the rest of her body. So the virus replicates in her nose. She doesn't even get a cold. She makes a response to that replicating virus which is very good, very robust and she is now protected against flu. This vaccine is now being offered to all children up to age 11 in the UK. Uh, the uptake is about 60%. We wish it was higher. But last year's effectiveness for those who did get it was 87%. So it's a really good vaccine. Now, why is the UK even giving children flu vaccine when we're the only country in Europe to be doing this? Um, and that brings us back to pandemics. One of the things about the last pandemic and the next pandemic is that we learn a lot in pandemics. Pandemics are like huge natural experiments. A new virus is released on the world and we, we can observe what happens. What we observed in the UK was that in the first few weeks of the last pandemic, in May and June, lots of people started going to their GP. And then in the middle of July, it all went away. And what happens in the UK in the middle of July? The schools break up. And what this told us is that children are the main spreaders of flu throughout our community. 
And if we can only control flu in the children, we can protect ourselves. So the children go back to school in September and the flu comes back again. Okay? So this was what persuaded the, uh, the people advising the uh, Department of Health, JCVI, the Joint Committee of Immunisation and Vaccines, that vaccinating children against influenza can save money, which is why they do it, and lives. And here's a Public Health England poster saying how successful it was in, in the year uh, pilots. But the graph I really like to concentrate on here, this is one of the early pilot experiments where the UK was split into different regions where children of either primary school age, shown in red, or secondary school age were given the vaccine. And then this graph down here is showing all-cause mortality in those different regions. And what you can see here is as the winter comes on, the people in the red region are less likely to die in the winter from outbreaks of respiratory virus than uh, people in the green or the yellow regions that got no vaccine at all. So what that says is that primary school children are very mucky and dirty and they like to mix around and then they go home and they give granny a big hug and they pass the flu around. And it's a really, really effective way if we could only increase that vaccination rate in the children from, from more than 60%, we could be in a good way. If we were to use that live attenuated vaccine in children at the start of the pandemic, there's a paper just come out from modelers in Hong Kong, suggesting that the whole pandemic scenario could be controlled if you could make the children immune in the first few weeks of the pandemic to the new virus. Now, how do we make these vaccines? This is a very, very old slide to emphasize that the way we make influenza vaccines is very old fashioned, and it's actually made by growing the virus up in chicken's eggs, whether or not it's the virus we're squirting up children's noses or the virus we're chopping up and putting in people's arms. We actually make vaccine in eggs. If the next pandemic is a virus that's come straight from chickens into humans and is killing lots of chickens, we could be in a pickle because there won't be any eggs. Okay? That's a serious concern. Um, it's a very, very long and complicated procedure. We know how to make flu vaccines. We make seasonal flu vaccines every year. We take viruses from around the world, we grow them in eggs, we then sort of mix them about a bit to make them safe, to make vaccines from. Uh, lots of people then do lots of standardization. This is a sort of graph of the World Health Organization every year making flu vaccine, and it takes about six months from start to finish to find the virus you want to make the vaccine against, work out how to grow it well enough in the eggs, make enough of it, package it, ship it out, and get it into people's arms. And indeed, in the last flu pandemic, making a vaccine against the new pandemic virus took six months or more. So here's that epidemiology curve again, the children breaking up from school, the flu vaccine coming back, and the first vaccines in the UK went into people's arms in about the first week in November by which time the second wave of this pandemic was almost finished. So we, we don't have the capacity nor the knowledge at the moment, nor the manufacturing prowess, if you like, to make a flu vaccine to a newly emerged pandemic virus fast enough to really make the difference that we'd like to make. That leads us to the dream of a universal flu vaccine. So if we... If we knew what virus was going to be the next pandemic, we could just make that vaccine now and stockpile it. But we don't know what virus it's going to be. We don't know whether it's going to be a bird flu from Vietnam or a pig flu from North America. And they're all different. They all need their own completely specific vaccine. But they're all flu virus. And so maybe there's something in common with, amongst them all. If we could only work out that, what that was, we could make one vaccine that we gave to people at the start of life, and they would never get seasonal flu, and they would never get pandemic flu when the next pandemic came either. The trouble is we just don't know how to do it. The virus is very, very clever. The bits of it that, that we respond to are the bits which are changing all the time and different between all the different strains. And the bits which are the same in the virus, if you make antibodies against them, you don't protect yourself against the virus, so it doesn't do you any good. So, at the moment, there is a huge amount of effort and money going into trying to make a universal flu vaccine. There are lots of startup companies, uh, the, the US government is plugging lots of money into this. 
but we do not yet have such a vaccine. And meanwhile, we are in a pickle because if the next pandemic comes along, we won't have a flu vaccine for six months. So what on earth will we do when everybody's panicking and the Daily Mail is predicting that, you know, 100,000 people are about to die of this new pandemic? We will have to have something to give people in the meantime while we get ready and make the new vaccine. So the best hope would be an antiviral drug, a, a medication, a pill to give people that will at least fight the virus off in their body and stop the virus from winning that battle. Stop those hundreds of thousands of copies of virus from accumulating and maybe even stop the virus passing from one person to the next. Now, of course, we have antiviral drugs already. We've had anti-flu drugs, actually, since the 1980s. But the most popular antiviral drugs that we have at the moment, the ones that are licensed and mostly used around the world, are Tamiflu and, and its sister, Relenza. So these are neuraminidase inhibitor drugs, so they're very specific for flu. They don't work against other viruses. They've been very, very cleverly designed based on the, the, the three-dimensional structure of the protein that's essential for the virus. And when bird flu first started infecting people in China back in the early 2000s, governments like the UK government and other European governments first world government started thinking there was a new pandemic coming which could be very dangerous and they needed to start stockpiling these drugs. And as you can see here, more than 500 million pounds was spent in, in that decade, in the first decade of the 21st century, in the UK alone, stockpiling enough Tamiflu for every one of us to have one week's course, as shown here, in the event of a pandemic. And in fact, these drugs are, are stockpiled in secret warehouses whose location none of us can know. Um, but if and when it's necessary, the warehouses will be opened up and the, the Tamiflu will be distributed to the appropriate people. So Tamiflu is a controversial drug. Um, it, it was licensed back in the 1990s, based on a series of clinical trials which was submitted to the licensing authorities, the FDA and the EAA. Um, and it was trialled properly in people with mild flu, and it showed an effect. However, not, when, when a drug gets licensed, not every single piece of information that the drug company uncovers during its clinical research goes into the licensing package. The drugs companies are allowed to put their licensing package together and choose what they want to show in order to persuade the authorities to give them a license to sell their drug. And Ben Goldacre, who is a, a very eminent and very vociferous um, medic, feels, along with the British Medical Journal and some other people, that this isn't right and that all the trials that a drug company ever performs when it's developing a drug should be public knowledge and should be taken into account during the licensing. Um, so he persuaded the Cochrane Group, an independent group, to reanalyse all the data that was provided by Roche and GlaxoSmithKline, the two manufacturers of these drugs. And they were reanalysed and indeed, they confirmed that taking Tamiflu when you have influenza illness does shorten your illness by about a day. 17 hours in adults, 29 hours in children. So it works, but it's not a lot, right? You still get sick. It still takes you four days to get better, whereas otherwise it would take you five days to get better. And some people feel nauseous and, and, and vomit when they take this drug as well. So should the UK government have spent £500 million stockpiling these drugs in the event of a pandemic? The Academy of Medical Sciences were asked to investigate and they looked at all the evidence, including what we call retrospective analyses, where the drugs have not been trialled in, in um, random controlled trials, but have actually been used in hospitals when people got sick and turned up to hospital. Did they get Tamiflu or not? And did they get better or not? And the evidence is very clear. When a person is sick enough to go to hospital, if they get Tamiflu within 48 hours of turning up, they get better, much more likely than if they don't. So 
So there are clear benefits. If you're ill enough with influenza and you need to be in a hospital, then, then Tamiflu is obviously beneficial. Nonetheless, this whole controversy has really clouded the use of this class of drugs. There is not, I think it's fair to say, a lot of confidence out there in the medical world about this class, which meant that there has been a race towards getting more drugs and different drug, one that worked in a different way, one that worked better, faster, more reliably. And this is the newest kid on the block in that race. This is Zofluza. So Zofluza is not yet available in the UK. It's not licensed yet in Europe, but it is licensed in Japan and the United States. And for the first year last winter, it was used in Japan, and six million doses of it were used in Japan, which is a lot because Japan is a, a huge country. And Zofluza uh, works in a completely different way than Tamiflu, but it, and it works very potently. It inhibits the replication of the virus by targeting the very machine that the virus uses to copy itself. People who take Zofluza, or Baloxavir, as its, as its proper chemical name is, seem to stop shedding their virus within 24 hours of receiving the drug. Whereas people who take Tamiflu continue to shed their virus for three days, and people who don't get any drug at all shed their virus for four days. So, Whilst you've got virus in your body, you're, you're going to carry on being ill, so stopping the virus is, is good, but this is also suggestive that in an early wave of a pandemic, for example, giving people this kind of drug could really interrupt transmission, because if people aren't shedding virus, they're not so likely to pass their virus on to the next person. That will slow down the pandemic, and then we might buy enough time to generate that vaccine, which we'd love to be able to give everybody. So that's, that's the plan, that using antivirals in the early waves might slow us and buy us time, slow the virus down. But who, who should be first in line? I mean, okay, we could buy enough doses uh, for everyone to have one dose, but we can't buy more doses than that. And people will start gaming. We already saw evidence of gaming drugs in the in last pandemic. So people went and phoned the NHS phone a friend um, flu line and said, oh, I'm very ill, I've got flu. And then you can go online you know, and find that they're selling boxes of Tamiflu for £100 each. So we, we're going to have to work out how to give people and who to give people their first doses. Talk about flu pandemics. We are in the middle of an obesity pandemic. The world is experiencing an obesity <coughs> pandemic. And obesity is a problem for many, many reasons, but with infectious disease, obesity is an issue because obese people have an altered immune state. Obesity is a, is a chronic inflammatory condition as, as well as having many other problems along with. And actually in the last flu pandemic, which was the first flu, flu pandemic where there were a significant number of obese people in the world, it was very obvious that obese people infected with flu are more likely to go to hospital, more likely to get severely ill, and more likely to shed out lots of virus. So we need to identify the new at-risk groups in the 21st century and plan our pandemic strategy accordingly. The other thing that we discovered in the last pandemic was that there are some people who are unfortunately for them genetically predisposed to fare badly with flu. So we already know that some people will fare badly if they're asthmatic or if they have heart disease, flu is a, is a problem and they're on the at-risk list. But the last pandemic in 2009 was the first time ever when we could analyse the genetics of people. And we were able to look at people who ended up in hospital with what was otherwise quite a mild virus versus everyone who, who'd got the virus that hadn't gone to hospital. And by sequencing the genomes of the people who ended up in hospital, we could find very rare variants, because we're all different. So some of us have got this variant in, in a particular gene. This particular gene here is called IFIT-M3, and it helps protect you against flu. And if you are a European, then only 0.3% of us have that rare variant. But of the Europeans who ended up in hospital, 6% of those had the rare variant gene variation. And interestingly, in China, 25% of Han Chinese have that variant anyway. And you still see this massive enrichment 
in the severely ill people who end up in hospital. So in China, more than 60% of the people in hospital had the rare variation. So maybe in the next pandemic, we'll be in an era where everyone is sequenced at birth, and we'll know that all the people with the IFIT M3 SNP need to get their vaccine first, or their antivirals first, because they can't help their genetics, and they're the ones who are going to end up in, in the hospital, uh, even if it's a mild virus. But that brings me just to the very end. This is all what we'll do when it happens, but could we, now we really understand where these pandemics come from, could we prevent the next pandemic even starting in the first place? So we think, or we know really, that pandemics come from wild birds, and the wild bird viruses pass usually through farmed animals with which humans are having close contact, and then the viruses mutate in such a way that they can pass through the air from one person to the next. What if our farmed animals could not be infected with influenza virus? Then they wouldn't pass on their virus to us, and our contact with wild animals is so infrequent that the chances of getting the pandemic from them is very small. So we now have a new technology in the world which is called CRISPR technology. This is a way of genetically editing genomes of animals. And we have CRISPR edited genomes of various animals, including chickens and pigs. So we can generate chickens now that are different genetically. So a couple of years ago during the research that, that I've been doing in Imperial, we discovered, for example, one particular host gene that, that encodes a factor inside host cells that all influenza viruses have to use. So when these viruses get inside cells, they take over our own machinery and then turn them for their own use and, and make all these thousands of copies of themselves. So what if chickens didn't have that host factor? or had an altered version of that host factor that the virus couldn't use anymore, then those chickens would be resilient or resistant even to infection with the flu virus. So we're now working with the Roslin Institute, just on the other side of this lovely country, where they of course created Dolly the Sheep, the world's first cloned animal. And at the Roslin they already know how to use CRISPR technology to edit chickens and pigs. And we are in the laboratory, under very controlled conditions, gene editing chickens to lack this particular piece of a small protein, which means that they won't be infected by flu viruses anymore. Um, of course, we've been, all, we've been changing chickens for years, we just don't know how. This chicken here is 60 years ago, and this is today's chicken. They are not genetically the same. They have been randomly bred for traits like big fat legs and lots of breast meat. What we're proposing to do is to make chickens that would still look like this, so the farmers will be happy because all the traits that the farmers like will still be there, but one gene or one part of one gene will be different enough in that chicken that if it's exposed to a flu virus, it won't be infected with that virus anymore. And that, I think, could protect us from the next pandemic, but also, of course, give food security because around the world there's a demand for protein and chicken is the fastest growing protein source to feed the world. So, with that controversial proposition, I'm going to round up and say there will be another flu pandemic. The severity could be anything from very mild to not. And I think that will depend on how it reaches us as humans, what its route from animals, uh, birds, through various animals is. We have got antiviral drugs, and there are more coming along. And we do know how to make vaccines, but it takes us a long time. So in the meanwhile, um, in the past, we had nothing. Okay. Uh, what we would love to have today would be to have universal flu vaccines that we would stockpile now, uh, a battery of other agents that would work cross-reactively against any flu virus that emerges, combinations of drugs, because one thing I haven't had time to touch on is that the sad reality that using single antiviral drugs just in the way that we see with bacteria and antibiotics now, leads to resistance. And we have lots of flu viruses out there that are becoming resistant to the drugs that we've got. We have to use them in combination, otherwise we're going to be in a problem. And I would propose to you that in the future we might farm gene-edited chickens and pigs 
that are altered in these essential host factors so that they can't be the conduits through which the virus will pass from wild birds into humans. So thank you very much for listening to me. I really do want to acknowledge a wonderful team of young people that I have the privilege to work with in my lab who do lots of hard work and are funded by these sources. And we have collaborators with Public Health England and the Institute of Animal Research at Purbright and, of course, the Bosley Institute as well. Thank you for listening.